Mr. Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I'm going to go very quickly. We have other presenters on this item. My purpose is to provide you an overview of uh, tax-related business incentives, uh, and we're going to talk about sales tax, income tax, and property tax. Uh, there are other uh, incentives, of course. I'm talking about um, these three areas and these three taxes. Um, just to give you some background, I'll just kind of go through there. It, the important thing with incentives is that they influence business decisions and that they make uh, uh, they have an econ economic impact and so the question is does that happen with incentives uh, reading the academic studies there's uh, there's evidence that there's small but statistically significant uh, impact on economic development and, and business uh, decisions it's their estimates are kind of unstable some show a huge impact some show no impact uh, and so but in general uh, most will say yeah there's a small but uh, statistically significant uh, impact uh, the question at the end uh, that people often ask is well what would have happened if if without the incentive and, and that's been mentioned here in the committee uh, it's it's hard to answer that question. Um, it's it's on people's mind, but it's hard to hard to get to the answer. Uh, okay, so quickly uh, for sales tax, primarily we're talking about exemptions here, and uh, the exemptions are just when you don't have to pay the sales tax for a particular pur purpose okay and those are typically for business inputs um, in fact I couldn't find a single one on the books that that's for economic development that, that wasn't a, a business input uh, meaning something that's used to produce a, a product or service that a business sells okay uh, when we talk about income taxes income tax incentives we're, we're talking about credits okay and and the credits there it's an amount of an amount subtracted from a taxpayer's income tax burden so the incentive is if you participate in such and such business activity or locate in a particular area of the state or provides a certain number of jobs then there's some uh, incentive there because you can get an, uh, an income tax credit um, property tax incentives I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail on the following slides but there we're talking about uh, tax increment and sometimes it's referred to as tax e increment financing we'll go through that just just briefly um, so you have a city or a county that creates a what's called a redevelopment agency that redevelopment agency has the same boundaries as the uh, city or county and the redevelopment agency then creates a project area to develop and that project area is going to be some uh, piece uh, of the redevelopment agency's boundaries or some piece of the city so it could be a couple of blocks uh, or it could be several uh, hundred acres so once that occurs a uh, tech which is called a, a taxing entity committee or an agreement determines how much tax increment goes to the project area I have here uh, de uh, the definitions of a, of a tech and an agreement and what I mean there I'm going to kind of go by uh, go past this and and move on to talk about the tax increment and and what is that okay so here in uh, the chart you have the blue the green and then you have the orange line the the blue is a base value of the property within a project area okay it's just like the the taxable value uh, that's going to be generating tax revenue for a project area and that's before uh, as demonstrated by the line before a project starts that's that's how they measure the the base value so you can see that blue does not go up and down uh, at least for the purposes of this it may uh, it, it, there's I think some possibility that it could go up and down but for the most part you're going to see it just be flat there on that base value okay and then the green is showing that as time goes on and development occurs there's more value in that 
in the land that's within the project area. And so that's the, t that's the increment value which is going to generate some, uh, the tax increment that, that's at the discussion when we're talking about redevelopment agencies. It uh, generates the money that, that can go to the, the redevelopment agencies for developing uh, the project. So just quickly, one more example here. You have the base value in blue, uh, and that generates uh, revenue for, for the taxing entity only. That goes to the taxing entity. And then the increment value uh, generates the tax increment, and the agency and the taxing entity uh, share based on the agreement. And so where you draw this line is based on the agreement that, that the taxing entity and the RDA agree on, okay, we're going to get 75% and, and you're going to take 25% and they agree on this. And uh, in some cases, uh, a taxing entity committee is involved and it's not done through the agreement. And again, there are a lot of details with, with RDAs. My purpose isn't to uh, provide all the details on that, but just to kind of give you a flavor for, for what we're talking about uh, as it pertains to tax increment and get a feel for, you know, what is that. So here I'm going to show you, uh, this is 2015 data, unless I couldn't find it. I got 2014 data, and that's the case for the tax credits. But these are select exemptions, sales tax exemptions, and income tax credits, and uh, tax increment. So they're in the green at the top, uh, and this is in millions, okay? So there, the green at the top is 166 million. That's the 2015 number uh, that was paid in increment by all uh, the taxing entities in uh, the state. Then. The next one down is in red. The red are sales tax exemptions. That's uh, the uh, manufacturing ex exemption that we uh, often talk about in this committee, 120 million. Then the research activities, that's a, an income tax credit, that's 50, 53 million. And so on down the line, you have uh, various credits and exemptions and again this is this is a static revenue impact okay it doesn't take into account the development that may have occurred uh, it, it's just you know how much revenue are we foregoing in this case there actually may be additional revenue that we're getting because uh, of these incentives that we're offering and again that's a hard question to answer uh, what exactly was the development that occurred and and uh, so I also have before you two handouts uh, that, that we, I distributed to you. One of them, uh, it's the very full page here, and this has the list of uh, uh, project areas that have been created by the various RDAs. And this list was uh, created by the Utah Redevelopment Association. Um, they s said that it's it's a pretty full list and has probably uh, most of them on on here. And so there's a little over 200. Some of those may be inactive uh, and and may not be uh, actively uh, developing. The other sheet, which would be really interesting to spend some time on, but I, I won't. I'll just kind of point it to you. Uh, is this one? It has uh, rainbow colors on the one side and then the blue on the other side, and on the blue side, this has how much increment was paid by county and then by taxing entity. So for example, the local districts in Box Elder County, how much tax increment did they pay? Uh, the cities in Box Elder County, how much did they pay? And, and so on through counties and schools. Uh, and then on the other side, it uh, allows you to kind of analyze this in percentages. Uh, you know, for Box Elder County, what was the total amount, what was the percentage of the total increment paid uh, that local districts uh, were part of, and that's 4% uh, for Box Elder County. How much of the total uh, did the cities pay and the counties and the schools and so on? Uh, and then it also has what's the percentage of, of uh, total taxes charged? So you can kind of compare that. Okay, they're, they're doing 5% of the total taxes charged, but only paying 4% of the uh, tax increment. And then the last column for each of the three or each of the four uh, taxing entities is the percentage of tax increment paid in relation to the 
or as a percentage of total taxes charged. So basically, uh, how much of my tax revenue am I paying towards uh, tax increment? Uh, and so that's that's the information I had. Sorry that was so fast, just due to time. Uh, gonna cut it off there. So. Okay. Mr. Elder, I feel badly because I can tell that was a lot of work to put that presentation together. So I really appreciate you doing that and doing that in short order. Okay, with that, uh, we're going to move on to uh, Mayor uh, Ben McAdams of uh, Salt Lake County. W what, what we're hoping to accomplish here in the next uh, really 10 minutes left that we have is uh, not necessarily a post-mortem on any specific deal, but necessarily deal with criteria that are being used by the different taxing entities and how they're, they're participating in the economic incentives. And, and then look, look at these criteria, and that's hopefully where I would like the policy conversation to go, and we'll probably have to make more time out, up for this on the agenda. But uh, to look at this in the future and say, are we using uh, the economic incentive tools the right way today, and should we continue to use them that way? So, yeah, so thank Mayor you, Mayor McAdams. Um, yeah, so we prepared a summary of some of Salt Lake County's guiding principles as we uh, look at some of these economic development incentives. Um, candidly, we started this work started about two years ago at the county, two and a half years ago, when we felt that um, county needed to play a stronger role in articulating goals and objectives and where we wanted to take our economic development policy. So we looked at some of the neighboring counties. Davis County has an economic development policy that they set, and so we developed a, a policy for Salt Lake County that the hope is, is to develop a strategic vision for how and when we would support uh, various incentives. And so uh, that policy is, is new. It's about a year old, and, and um, we're just seeing the first um, proposals coming forward under that new policy. But we set forward some core guidelines, and I think as we've looked at some of the new proposals that come forward, we have some ideas on how we might refine that policy forward, uh, further. We'll need to refine the policy to reflect changes in state law from the last session. Um, but our policy had set forward uh, an amount, a maximum uh, increment that we would give and a time, uh, a length of time for which we'd support an increment, and then what we'd hope to see uh, any tax increment uh, support in, in our community. And so we laid out that vision. Um, I would, first of all, like to say that I think if we go to the, the first slide, just to complement the state on some of the great things we have going uh, as a state that make us well poised for economic development, uh, the state's provided good leadership on things like a, a, a workers' uh, compensation policy, um, low health insurance rates, uh, great energy costs for the state of Utah, and then um, just the state leadership's been solid as we've as we've looked, and I think it's created a business business friendly environment that puts us uh, at the leading edge when it comes to to uh, growing our economy and growing our tax base through. Uh, uh, economic development. So if we'll go to the next slide, these are some of the principles that I talked about. We want to use our scarce public resources, including tax increment funds, to focus on encouraging economic development. So we look at um, does it create a net positive for the taxpayer, um, fostering healthy communities. So it's not just about uh, only about growing jobs, but it's growing in a sustainable way that adds to the quality of life in the Salt Lake Valley. Um, supporting sustainable regional development. So we support collaborative uh, community-led efforts. The county isn't in the business of telling any of our 17 cities what they should do or how they should zone their land, but, um, but we do want it to add to a, 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 the value of economic development in the valley and quality of life and, and certain things. So um, we've asked that any proposal that come forward to the county for participation in tax increment is linked to some of these long-term goals. Um, we've started developing a vision for economic development, including uh, our Global Cities Initiative that focuses on our exports and growing exports in the Salt Lake Valley. The national data on exports is great about the ability to create higher jobs, higher paying jobs, more jobs. And so we've developed a metro export plan through our Global Cities Initiative. We're working with the World Trade Center Utah on that. We have our partnership for a Greater Salt Lake uh, that's looking at economic development goals. We're in the process right now of evaluating tax increment financing in, in Salt Lake County. LEAF's done some of this great work, but we currently have 96 project areas that are active in the Salt Lake Valley for a total lifetime uh, increment investment over the, the life of these projects of $1.1 billion is what is, is, has been invested through tax increment in Salt Lake County. Um, looking at unique econ regional economic development opportunities in the Salt Lake Valley, um, the Mountain View Corridor and vacant land adjacent to uh, 
great transportation and access to some of our great states, great amenities like how affordable housing, um, access to an international airport, interstates, uh, Union Pacific Hub. These are that Mountain View corridor is an incredibly valuable asset for economic development. And then also the point of the mountain and planning uh, around the point of the mountain. That's also a unique opportunity. Um, I'm trying to keep it quick so we can go to the next slide. And this is just some of our analysis. Of Mayor, just so you know, we're, we're, we are going to extend our time a little bit okay. past 11 o'clock. So okay. uh, don't feel too badly. I, I want to make sure we have enough time. It Great. looks like there's enough people who are interested in the subject. And yeah. we have a lot of questions from members of the committee. So I don't want to shortchange this time. We are going to get a little shorter time for lunch today. Uh, for those of you who are here on the committee, I know you're pretty upset. Uh, Senator Mackis is walking out in protest. Uh, <laughs> So, anyways, uh, I, I don't I don't want to hurry this because I think there are some important policy decisions that we need to make, and we may need to spend sure. a few minutes Great. of our uh, of our that's, lunch time. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, we are in the process of evaluating uh, TIF throughout Salt Lake County, uh, and and what it means, what we've accomplished with our tax increment financing. This project just got underway recently. Um, we haven't really previously had the staffing capacity to do a lot of this analysis, but we felt it is very important that we understand not just leave it up to the 17 cities to um, self-evaluate, but the county wants to understand um, what we're getting for our investment in tax increment. And uh, so we're in, in, engaged in that right now. But here's what we know right now. As I said, 118 project areas that have been uh, authorized in, the, in Salt Lake County, 22 of them are expired, 96 are active. Most of those predate um, my service as mayor. Um, Countywide investment from all taxing entities, that includes not just the county, but school districts and cities, $1.14 billion. Um, on average, the school district, because of very uh, relative property tax rates, the school district is about 50% of any increment. Uh, the county is about 25% of any increment. Average project length has been 21 years. Average time to trigger is five years. The county geography that's in project areas is almost 12,000 acres. Uh, and the total county geography that's on the tax rolls right now is 384,000 acres. Um, we have some concerns, and let me, I'm going to, I think you can go to the next slide, but maybe just to take a moment to articulate as we look at some of the, as we're developing this policy and we've, uh, I think we've got some things right and some things that we might want to refine both as a county and with our, working with our cities, but also working with the state. Um, I think we need a conversation uh, amongst the state, the counties, the counties and the cities about what is our strategic vision for incenting economic development. Uh, sometimes I feel like we take them on a one-off and and it, you know, we shoot from the hip and see if it works, and we kind of know it if we see it, know it if we see it, if it's good economic development. I think we can be more strategic than that. Um, is our policy to incent everything and to pay whatever it takes to uh, achieve uh, to to win an, uh, a corporate relocation, or is there a conversation about if we should have incentives? What should we incent, and how much would we be willing to incent? I think we need to take maybe a step back and have that macro, high-level conversation. Utah is very different today than we were 10 and 20 years ago. And I think, you know, I, I've um, lived outside of the state of Utah, born and raised here, but lived outside of the state and, and traveled the world. And um, we've got something pretty special here, and people are realizing it. And, and, uh, and we've kind of built critical mass. We've got great companies and, and a, a great business climate that really works in our favor. So I think it might be time to uh, reevaluate if we if – the vision that we employed 20 years ago or 10 years ago is still the vision of today, or have we changed in a way that we can um, pull back on the throttle a little bit and, uh, and let what's great about Utah continue to drive our, our economic development with a different approach to incentives? So I think that's something worth um, a conversation worth having, uh, and um, we'd love to be a part of that conversation. Um, as I mentioned, the county policy looks at a ceiling, really, of, of what we, the most we would be able to do. That doesn't mean that everybody who asks for an incentive is going to receive that county incentive. But the, the guideline that we've specified is we'd be willing to do up to a 75% increment for up to 20 years, uh, and then certain things that we'd want to see. We'd want to, uh, every, of course, every budget that's proposed, we would expect a cap on that incentive, uh, that if projects develop faster, uh, at a faster pace than might have been projected, that that doesn't result in a windfall to a third party, but that we, we know and make a conscious decision about what we're willing to, to support. And then we look at what the benefit to the community is. What's the community infrastructure that's going to not only uh, grow the tax base, uh, uh, but enhance our quality of life. Um, so 
with the economic development policy, um, some of the concerns we right have right now is with the local development, local economic development processes, uh, as a process that really um, pits city against city and county against county in a race to the bottom in which local jurisdictions are put in a mosh pit to see who's going to fight the hardest and give up the most and the winner takes all in our economic development. I think that's something that it, it would be timely for us to reevaluate if there's a better way because what, what we do right now, we, I think we make a good decision to sophisticate economic development thinking and expertise at the state level. And I don't think the county wants to duplicate what the state has, nor should any city duplicate what the state has. But if when push comes to shove in economic development, if what we're doing is we're pushing five cities into a mosh pit and telling them to negotiate on behalf of the state and the county and the school district and themselves to see what they can come up with, we're losing that expertise because we're not providing that leadership that would, that would help us to evaluate what the cost benefit would be of a particular investment. You know, we, we know that there's a cost and in incentives and what's the benefit. And I don't know that 29 counties and 240 something cities um, that we want to have, we want to push it down to that level for them to do the cost benefit analysis. If we've, making a if we've made a decision to centralize the sophistication of doing or performing a cost benefit analysis, um, that is what needs to lead uh, our economic development incentives. So we're concerned about that approach that really pits city against city in a, in a race to the bottom. Um, the process is oftentimes driven by state or metro level entities, yet the largest inve investors are, are the local taxing entities. And then uh, I think it's worthy of a conversation about school district participation and at what level a school district would participate. We all know that um, you know, many of these economic incentives are building public infrastructure like roads, uh, stormwater, other things that are public infrastructure that, that I think it's appropriate to ask the counties and the cities to participate in some of that investment. Uh, but it may not be appropriate for uh, a school district to uh, participate in that. I haven't drawn a hard line on incentives that, um, you know, I think our, our philosophy, I think state and county and city philosophy has been, again, we, we know it's good when we see it. Um, and, and I'm not saying that they're all bad. I think that we need to evaluate. We need to be more sophisticated than we know it when we see it. We need to uh, maybe telegraph a little bit better. What are we looking for? What are the gaps in our um, our tax base that we're looking to fill out? How much are we willing to pay to fill those gaps? And not just incenting everything and paying what it takes to, to win uh, in a race to the bottom. Um, so I think a conversation about whether school districts should participate in tax incentives and to what extent and under what circumstances a school district might participate are, are worthwhile conversations to have. Um, I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, we have concerns and the state I think has, uh, the state has um, repealed this process but real concerns with the um, taxing entity input uh, and the EDA process. Um, taxing entity we believe undermines any local entity's responsibility over taxes so we're happy to see the state moving in the direction of, uh, of a process where each local entity would consciously through their own legislative process decide to opt in and support terms uh, for uh, an incentive rather than one where um, it's subject to a, 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 a vote of a taxing entity committee where taxing jurisdictions are, are simply represented. And we think that even raises some constitutional concerns about uh, the responsibility of a local jurisdiction to um, have stewardship over their uh, locally imposed taxes. Um, and then uniformity and transparency, different accounting and report, reporting policies. This is where the county is trying to uh, understand better the 96 uh, uh, project areas that we have out there and how, they, um, how they're applied and how we can might um, make sure that we have uniformity and consistency in our policy rather than a one-off decision about each individual uh, investment. Um, one of the challenges, I think, that um, is frequent changes to state law makes hard, it hard to compare apples to apples as we perform this analysis. And I think state law changes that we've seen in the past are justified and understandable. But as we are working through this process of evaluating um, decisions that have been made in, in the Salt Lake metro area in the past, um, those are some of the challenges we're encountering. But we're working through this process of, of evaluating our, um, our tax increment. So with that, um, I would conclude our presentation and open it to um, any questions. Yeah, that's uh, thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, we'll go to Representative Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a couple of questions. Okay. Yeah. okay. It's your lunch, not mine. 
Uh, how much influence do you think the county should have on economic development of cities in the county? I think the county should have uh, unilateral discretion over county taxes that are imposed and spent. And then um, one of the things we've been careful about is we don't, I don't believe it's the county's place to necessarily um, dictate a vision or zoning or other principles in a local jurisdiction, but we do feel um, very protective of our, uh, of our discretion over county tax dollars. And then one of the things that we feel is important is that, um, that we don't want 17 different approaches to economic development in the Salt Lake Valley. We think we're better off if we have a unified vision about where we want to take our Salt Lake metro area. That process would not be a top-down county process, but more of a collaborative process, similar to what we're seeing with the Point of the Mountain Commission right now, which is nobody's telling Draper how they're going to zone their land or um, or what to do with the 700 acres at the at the former soon-to-be former prison site. But we do know that we're all interested in having and seeing that that's done successfully, and so we've created the Point of the Mountain Commission where the county's represented, the state's represented, surrounding cities and counties are represented, and we're all coming together for a collaborative visioning process. And so that's what I think um, is a Good, a model of how good economic development policy would be set throughout the Salt Lake metro area. Okay, thank you. So you listed your guiding principles, and they, they sound good, and they're new, and they're under your administration. Um, but do they create a disparity for sort of newer cities that um, tend to be on the outskirts of the county? Um, historically, Almost every other city in the county has had some benefit from these these incentives, and and now I'm concerned that maybe we look at the last remaining green, green belt in the county and say, well, wait, 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 hold on, wait. Now everybody cares about how you're developing this, um, and, and nobody cared when the land was more abundant, um, where other cities benefited. But now that we're kind of we're abutting a mountainside, and we have limited space, I. I'm concerned that we look at policies that all of a sudden everybody else cares about now, um, the, that, that land. And, and so while the, the principles sound good, are we creating a disparity for these newer towns on the outskirts of the counties? So I don't think so. You know, I can't, I can't uh, say what, what policy considerations informed uh, the the project areas that were approved at Salt Lake County before I was mayor. I do know that I feel a, a strong responsibility to make good policy decisions with the policies that come to me during my term as mayor. I am not opposed to uh, and not drawing a line in the sand of no incentives. I think we do just need to perform a cost benefit and, um, and that cost benefit needs to always weigh in favor of, of the taxpayer. Um, to be clear, I think that uh, you know, I'm not ruling out future incentives for some of this land on the, on, uh, along the Mountain View corridor, but I do believe that um, we have already uh, invested in the economic development potential of that land. The state has invested, I don't know the exact number, but well over a billion dollars in building transportation infrastructure to service that land. And so that is in, in some ways an incentive and an investment of state tax dollars to make that land more valuable because of the, of the proximity to incredible transportation infrastructure. I do believe that the, the Mountain View Corridor represents the greatest economic development opportunity in the Salt Lake metro area and perhaps in the state, even exceeding uh, the former prison site with its potential to be a game changer for economic development for Utah. And it's one that, um, like the former prison site, warrants uh, thoughtful uh, and deliberate uh, action as a, as a state because of the state's investment in, in the Mountain View Corridor and the transportation there and on behalf of the county and, and the cities that align that, that the outcome can be so much better if we come together and coordinate in a, in a collaborative fashion rather than taking um, one-off approaches to, uh, to the future, to division the future of that land. Thank you. One more question. Um, so there's an elephant in the room. Um, that this uh, has brought these questions to light. So I'd, I would just like to throw a couple numbers at you and see what you think. Um, just in the last two years is the handout that we received with the, the tax increment payments. Um, Salt Lake City currently, just of the last two years, and these incentives have been around for 50 to 70 years in our state. In Salt Lake City there, it's currently 1,093 acres, which represents about one acre per 175 residents. 
For Ogden City, it's 1,149 acres, and that's about one per 73. West Valley City has over 3,000. That's about one acre per 41 residents. Now, um, the neighbor uh, part of my district um, in South Jordan has 1,000, over 1,000, and that's one per 59. Um, West Jordan currently has 277 acres in project area, and that is one per 400 residents. On a per capita basis, that's one of the, the, um, the, the lowest tax incentivized lands. Um, the project area that was proposed would have brought that number only to about 108. So, um, so part of the argument about this particular deal was that um, it was too large in investment, but that it was also too large in size. And so I would say that even the size of this, I mean, West Jordan is um, very far under um, represented in, in how much of, of its land is dedicated under a project area. Um, extremely different. 400, 1 in 400 compared to Salt Lake City, 175. Or West Valley, my neighbor to the north, 1 per 41 residents. So there is clearly right now a disparity in how cities in your county have been able to take advantage of these tax incentives. But then all of a sudden when there is a scarcity of land, and granted the Mountain View corridor gives a more global interest in that economic development, but when there's a scarcity of land, all of a sudden we want to lock that down. And, um, and th there does exist a disparity in acreage that is dedicated in our project areas. And so what would you say to that? Well, first of all, I would I'd point out that um, Salt Lake County has not, uh, during my tenure as mayor, has not um, created any project areas in Salt Lake City. So there are policy decisions that have been made in the past, and, and I think we'd have to talk to former elected officials to see what motivated those policy considerations. Um, I would question, again, I think there's, this is the time to have a conversation about what are our economic development goals and what do we hope to accomplish through incentives. I believe that a uh, acre incented per resident is probably a bad goal. The goal isn't to have more acres per resident incented um, and almost it's, it seems to me that it would be to the benefit of the residents of West Jordan that they have their tax base is free and clear and able to support public services, their law enforcement, fire, and others, um, rather than having it given away to third parties or tied up in, in taxing uh, project areas that might not benefit them. So I would almost think that the goal might be to reduce the acre per resident um, tied up in project areas while still growing the economy. And what that magic number is, I don't know. I think that's a, a worthwhile conversation to have if we want to act deliberately and intentionally and not in a haphazard fashion. Um, you know, I think, th again, the Mountain View Corridor and the billion-plus investment, probably s multiple billion investment on the Mountain View Corridor, is the greatest economic development asset we have in the state today. And we need to make sure that we act deliberately to bring that to the value of, of uh, the residents of West Jordan. You know, I think it would be a, a serious mistake to tie up all of that land um, as incentives to um, to non-residents of West Jordan in order to... Um, you know, to put put down concrete that may not have value, uh, it, where we might be able to bring in tax-paying entities that would offset costs and offset taxpayers to the homeowners is a much better strategy uh, to employ. But I think that's the conversation we'd have. What are our goals of economic development? Um, what do we want to achieve? I don't. I, my goal is not more tax incentives. It's the right level of tax incentives to appropriately grow, grow our economy. Oh. Sorry, I thought. I, I, I agree it's not the best metric, but it is one that we have, and it is one that it was um, one of the points of opposition was the size of the investment, uh, 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 the, the acreage size of the project area. Um, and, and granted, in the Salt Lake metro area, uh, I would anticipate that. Um, that projects would be infill projects that wouldn't consume acreage. So it's not the best, it is not the best um, metric, but I would like to see, and I have already asked Mr. Elder if he would, if he would give us um, the, the tax increment paid by city. And, and again, moving forward is one question, but I think for me it's, it's beneficial to have context because what we've heard for the last two months is this project's 
too big, too rich, too name it, but there hasn't been a context for for what does that mean? To to what's yeah, um, maybe, maybe what isn't too big? And I think that's actually a bigger conversation for a, another time. But but I'd like to at least put that on the table that when we're talking about um, a particular project being too much, there's always going to be a bigger project. There's always going to yeah. be a bigger project. And so what is where do we draw those lines? Where do we create those policies? So I just want to put on the table that I'd like our committee to be able to have the fuller context of what's happened historically that we can sort of maybe fill out where those lines are more appropriate. And, and really nobody had an offering of what would be not too rich, not too so, big. And, and just that our, this one was. One of our concerns with that project area, so as, I, as we showed on the slide, Salt Lake County has geography of about 11,000 acres that's currently within project areas in our cities. Uh, the proposed project area was almost 2,000 acres. So that would have been um, equal to about 20% of the 96. The, that one alone would have been equal to 20% of the other 96. It was very, very large. Our average size is about 110 acres. Uh, that one was 1,700 acres, so enormous uh, to begin with. And the other thing I said is what we want to do is we engage in incentives, if, if and when we engage incentives, is to do it deliberately and intentionally. And the concern I had with the 1,700 project, acre project area was not only the size, but that there was no plans. Uh, for development. We didn't know, you know, it could have been an incentive for half acre lot homes and, you know, or, or we just, the county didn't know and the county is very um, resistant to uh, committing our precious tax dollars to uh, something that's unknown and that was was unknown and, and we asked, you know, what is the plan for this and, they, and the response was that the plan would be developed after the creation of the project, uh, the project area and we said Salt Lake County doesn't do that with our tax dollars. We don't write blank, blank checks. Um, to then find out later how the how the tax dollars would be spent, we uh, the public funds are sacred, and we want to be uh, careful and and wise stewards of those public funds. You're unfortunate or fortunate, depending on how you look at it, Mayor. No one here wants to eat lunch, <laughs> Senator Stevenson, which I'm fine with. I'm engrossed by the conversation, but uh, I, I just want to make sure everybody understands we're in the double overtime. I think that's and, and I'm, I'm I'm grateful, candidly, that you're willing to stay here because this is a very meaningful conversation, I think, for the future of the state, and I think this is a great conversation to be having, and uh, I wish we had two more or four more interims to just have a whole day discussion on this, and maybe that's something we'll propose next year. Thank you, and thank you, Mayor. I, I really appreciate the principles that you have established and agree with most of them. I'd like to carry it a little further, though, and I have, I'm, I'm opening a bill file to accomplish this, and especially relative to uh, Representative Coleman's comments, which I couldn't disagree with more. Uh, I, I intend to have legislation that will prohibit a tax increment from ever taking more than 50% of a school district's property tax increment. Uh, we know that Utah spends less per student than any state in the nation. We cannot say that about cities, counties, and special districts, uh, that they are spending less than other cities in the nation. And therefore, I, I think there should be that bar beyond which you cannot go in giving away this, these tax increments. What we have found is that local school boards are uneducated on this, and they give in to the pressure and are willing to give away uh, tax dollars that are, are dearly needed for our school children. Secondly, this part of our, our history in tax increment financing has been this war among the cities for the location of retail. And we as a legislature have created that war by having uh, the distribution of sales tax 50% based on population and 50% on point of sale. And so there has been this war for car dealerships, for malls, and all that kind of stuff, which does not... Uh, grow the economy in one iota. There's not one more pair of shoes sold or one more retail job in the state of Utah because of this tax increment in millions given away and now it's 89 million annually to, from schools. Uh, that, and Representative Coleman's point about uh, West Jordan doesn't have as much acreage used in tax increment financing as others is as is as uh, wrong-headed, with all due respect, as this war for retail. I mean, 
wh why should a city like a, a, a bedroom community like Bountiful say, well, we want our share of acreage in tax increment financing so that we can take money, as much money away from school children and give it to a developer as somebody else. I think the acreage argument is totally flawed and shouldn't even be considered. So I have, I have a bill that also, besides limiting the 50% uh, of the increment that can come from school districts, also, I think we need to have a regional basis for this consideration of where a, a, a new project that is attractive goes, rather than them going from city to city and finding the weakest link, city council, that then gives away the store. There ought to be some cohesive approach to this that isn't just finding the weakest link. We need to defend that property tax base, and there has to be a system to do it, and, and it ought to include the legislature and the local entities, and maybe the county, the counties across the state ought to be maybe the, the, uh, the, 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 the level at which we decide within the county where that kind of happens, because it shouldn't be based on, well, every city deserves a certain percentage of acreage. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, Senator, I would support that legislation. I think what you described is a classic, classical prisoner's dilemma. If I don't do yeah. it, my neighbor will, and my neighbor will win, so I better do it. And um, the only tool I think th at this point we've seen that plays out. And if City A, in, in, in the case of Project Discus, four cities said no, and the fifth one did it. Um, if, we, um, if we allow the prisoner's dilemma to play out, it's somebody's going to do it, and, um, and, maybe, and the, if the tool's available, it'll be used. And so maybe the only answer is to restrict the availability of the tool. I was going to say the same thing. That was okay. uh, very well said. Thank you very, very much, Mayor. Uh, I'm going to go to Representative Briscoe, and then we'll go back to Representative Colin, who would like to explain how wrong-headed Senator Stevenson is. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Representative you, Representative Briscoe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome, Mayor. Uh, the chair said we were not going to discuss any specific project, so we will not mention West Jordan or Facebook. Let's let's just call it Project Voldemort from now on. But the issue, uh, but the issue has been raised by another member of the committee. I attended the meeting at West Jordan that the Salt Lake County held. I sat and listened, listened to the citizens talk about this issue. At 1,700 acres, they were only going to develop 230, and they were going to give away 250 million dollars. By my calculation, that's 13 percent of the project land. If they had to give away similar incentives to develop the remainder of the 1,700 acres, that would approach $1.5 billion in tax incentives, 50 percent of it or more coming from the school district, 25 percent of it going to the way to pupil unit. I would like to know how much money every single economic development project in Utah is taking from the weighted pupil unit? <coughs> Thank you. That is a great question, Representative. I think that's uh, also something. So uh, the lights are, uh, it is a Christmas tree up here. Um, I think what this highlights, uh, and I'm going to go to your lights, I think what this highlights though, Mayor, is that uh, everyone has their uh, ideal incentive, right? And everybody's trying to do, uh, and what I take from all of this conversation thus far is everyone's trying to do the, what's in the best interest of the state. Uh, and I think, uh, I think that is a valuable conversation as long as we stay focused on those criteria. I think the state this kind of conversation is something that will be invaluable. And as I look at it, I'm, I'm actually, uh, this will, this may or may not turn off a few lights, but I'm going to ask Legislative Management Committee if we can meet as, a, as, a, in, as an interim revenue tax meeting between now and the November meeting and see if we can spend enough time because I'm looking at the audience and there are a number of people who would like to speak and I think would have a valuable perspective as well on this conversation. So, um, So uh, what I'm going to, uh, I'm going to go to these two lights, uh, the last two lights, Representative Ellis and Representative Coleman, and then I apologize because I'm going to cut everyone else off. Uh, it's a time to adjourn, adjourn the meeting, and I only can get away with so much with a chair before they will lynch me out on the uh, Capitol steps. Uh, uh, so, and I'll have uh, a couple of comments uh, to, to say there as well. Uh, Representative Coleman. Thank you. So I, I have not said anything publicly about this p particular deal. So I, I don't think I'm wrong-headed. I think that um, 
the senator um, actually um, I tried to highlight why this system is wrong. This system doesn't make Pardon a me whole for just lot a second. of sense. Representative, Representative Paulson, I, I need you for just a minute. If you just hang out for just a minute more. I, know, I appreciate your patience. Thank you. Sorry, Representative Coleman. Okay. So my point is that there's always been disparity. There continues to be disparity. It makes sense to have a different policy. There are some things in the current policy that have no nexus to economic development that we need to look at changing. So I don't disagree with any of the things that have been said. I'm pointing out that we that there was opposition to a particular deal that didn't have any context relative to anything else. And, um, and, and the acreage issue, no, we should not base policy on that, absolutely not base policy on that. But for the fact that it was raised as a point of opposition on a project with no context whatsoever. And so, so I, I'm actually trying to make the point that um, Senator Stevenson made that um, we do have problems in this policy. We do have problems in this policy. Um, in representing the west side of this county, though, I also have to, I have to ask what is right in the economic development for those last remaining acres of green belt that now everybody notices and everybody wants to say nobody cared when it was the east side, nobody cared when it was north or south. All of a sudden, when land's a scarcity, everybody wants to have a little bit more say on that. But I agree, I don't like the school portion. That's been a very complicating factor for me, um, personally as well, you know, generally. And um, so I just want that on the record. I'm not defending this, this particular negotiation, this particular deal. I am looking very carefully at the process, which has many, many flaws. So. You know, I, I, my uh, opposition to the Facebook proposal was that it was just didn't pass the cost benefit test. Uh, and we would have been paying about $3 million per job, and, and these jobs weren't, um, I, I think they weren't the jobs that would fill a niche in our market. They were custodial and, and groundskeeping and other types of jobs for the data center. So I don't think it passed the cost benefit test. Uh, I would have opposed that uh, wherever it was, it was um, located. Although I do believe that my opposition to that particular project was because I care about the west side and I care about economic development on the west side, and that would have harmed uh, our west side communities and their ability to grow their tax base. Other places have seen economic development growth without an 85 percent uh, incentive over what amounts to 10 percent of the city of West Jordan would have been in this project area subject to an 85 percent tax rebate. That would have harmed school kids in the Jordan School District. It would have harmed the taxpayers of West Jordan because they wouldn't have been able to grow their tax base because the tax base would have been locked up with a promise to pay those tax dollars to developers or corporate entities who would want to pay it to their shareholders. And so out of concern and for the benefit of the residents of West Jordan, the kids in the Jordan School District and the people of Salt Lake County, we could not afford to lock up that, that amount of acreage into a very lucrative incentive. We need to use those acres uh, because they are prime real estate, and I think they represent the best economic development opportunity in this state. They should be used for the benefit of the school districts and for the taxpayers to defray taxes, not to, um, not to hand it out to developers. Okay, we've mentioned Project Voldemort enough today. Representative Ellison. <clears throat> Just a very brief comment as a follow-up to Representative Briscoe's request on the weighted pupil unit. As a CPA, I'm very well aware that there's two parts of every uh, income statement, the top line and the expenses and the bottom line. So in fairness, if we're looking at simply the costs, I believe if this analysis is to be done, we should also look at what revenue is driven in terms of income tax related to economic development, so we have a balanced picture of that issue. That's great. Thank you, Representative. Okay, uh, with that, I think we've had a very lively discussion on this, albeit an abbreviated discussion on this. And I think uh, the mayor, uh, Representative Coleman, and uh, many others would like to continue this conversation. I think we probably could for a while. With that, I'm going to uh, I'm going to ask for a motion from the committee so that we can uh, ask for uh, a interim day, uh, an extended interim day to review these policies and potentially look at between now and, and the session, looking at some of these criteria and seeing if there isn't something we can do. So uh, I'll go to Representative Coleman. So moved. 
Do I have to repeat your motion, your suggested motion? I just looked and uh, I'm counting senators and we're one short. So if we had one more per senator, we would have a quorum. With that, I'll, uh, I will take that motion under advisement if and say chairs. that uh, I, I appreciate the support and a, uh, a simple smile from the committee will say that uh, we've got your support and with that we have one more uh, further uh, uh, motion. Uh, Representative Coleman, you want to make that motion as well? Yes. Adjourn. Motion for lunch. Uh, that is in order. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? We are adjourned. And I apologize for those who are here to testify as I'm looking forward to hearing your testimony. Education. <laughs>